Hello, everyone. My name is Jim Stinger, and I am the president of the San Francisco chapter of the Society of West Coast Artists. And welcome to our November artist demonstration. The Society of West Coast Artists is a member organization, and we depend on our membership to run the organization. So if you are not a member and would like to become a member, please go to our website, www.societyofwest-coastartists.com. There is membership information there, and you can look at what our other demos are and so on and so forth. So please consider joining if you're not already a member. We have a gallery in San Bruno that you can take advantage of for, to display your, your artwork. So there are many benefits of, of joining. Please consider doing that. Today's artist is Eric Jacobson. And his website is Jacobson Fine Art. That's Jacobson spelled with an E. And I'm going to introduce him to you right now. Eric Jacobson was born and raised in New England. He received a BA in history from Gordon College in Wenham, Massachusetts in 1989 and studied fine art at the Lyme Academy of Fine Arts in Old Lyme, Connecticut from 1991 to 1995. At the Academy, he received training in the Beaux Arts tradition of drawing and painting from life. Eric's true inspiration is the amazing beauty that he sees in nature. Jacobson is a plein air painter. He takes his oils wherever he goes, setting up on site, working until his painting is finished. Quote, it is most important to me that my paintings convey a certain mood, unquote, Eric says. I want them to be felt by the viewer without his or her having to analyze or think about them. As a general rule, I try to find strong composition in nature and then paint the scene accurately while leaving out any extraneous details which would only busy up the painting and detract from the strength of the piece as a whole. My painting process consists of finding a painting site and setting up to paint for a couple of hours or until the light has changed. For larger paintings, I will return on consecutive days at the same time under similar lighting conditions to finish a piece. And he has a very long list of awards that he has received on his website. I suggest you go there and take a look at that list. It's, it's impressive. So it is our pleasure today to uh, have Eric demonstrate for you uh, the, the expressive landscape type of painting. And I believe that's, that's what he's going to, to tell us about. So I'm gonna turn it over to Eric, thank you. Well, thank you, Jim. Hello, everybody. It's nice to be here. Um, it's a little odd to be, um, you know, meeting with you on Zoom. Uh, of course, it's uh, it's something we have to do because I'm in Maine and you're out there in California or wherever you are. But um, I'm pleased to be able to do this. I'm, you know, thanks to Jim and Sharon and uh, the others who were involved in um, setting this up so that I could do this. And uh, so, yeah, Jim, Jim, ex you know, told a little bit about who I am and um, about what I do. And so I am a landscape painter. I paint in oil. And I also, um, for the past few years, I've been painting in acrylic as well. And uh, I, I enjoy both mediums. Uh, and I primarily paint from life, which is on location. Um, so plein air painting. And... Um, I do a little bit of studio work, Obvious, obviously today we're in the studio. You can see I've got, I've got my setup here and hopefully we'll talk about this. Hopefully when I get this all set up and squared away, um, you should be able to see this board straight on. So if you're worried about it being at an angle, just wait, that'll be, uh, that'll change. So what I'm gonna do today is I'm going to uh, paint from a reference photo. Um, just just out of sight of the camera here, I have a monitor, a TV monitor that has an image on it. Um, and the image is of some clouds. And if Jim, if you don't mind, if you're able to share that, um, I'll get right to it and just show you what the um, reference is for today. There it is. Thank you, Jim. Sure. So there's a there's a photo from 
out in New Mexico uh, from a recent trip that I was on. Uh, and New Mexico has wonderful clouds, you know, from time to time. And in fact, the whole time that I was there, which was about five days, six days, something like that, um, we had beautiful clouds every day rolling through. It was really nice. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to, that, that's the reference photo. I wanted you to have a look at that um, so that you know that, that what I'm working on. Now, when I go ahead and set up here, you're not going to be able to see the reference photo uh, while I'm working. Um, because it just, it just, what that would end up uh, doing is causing me to have to move the camera back so far that you'd hardly be able to see, you know, the board that I'm going to work on. So I think it's better, obviously, to, to be able to see what I'm working on here. So, um, Jim, I think what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start right in. And, um, what I'm going to do is, um, I'm gonna, I want you to ask questions. And from what I understand, Jim, they can, questions can be submitted. Is that how people do it? That's correct, in the chat, yes. Okay, in the chat. And then um, Jim, you'll ask me the question is, again. Is that how that works? Yes, yes. Okay, so here's the thing. This demo is for all of you, okay? It, it's not about me, so really, it's not, it's not, because I'm special that I'm doing this, this could be any one of you who's doing this demo. Um, and in fact, I'd love to be on the other end watching somebody else. That's one of my favorite things to do is watch somebody else paint. But it's awful nice to be able to ask a question and know maybe what um, what the artist is thinking. So I'm gonna talk while I'm doing my demo and I'll try to explain reasons why I'm doing things or, or thoughts that come to my mind. Uh, but there's obviously going to be things that you're wondering that I'm not addressing. So go ahead and send that question to Jim and he'll, he'll ask me. And I don't, I don't mind asking, uh, I mean, answering hundreds of questions. It doesn't matter. There's no, there's no bad question. As long as it's relating to what we're doing today, um, that's great. Okay. So just know that about me. And I look at this as um, a very informal setting, like I said, so I want you to enjoy yourselves. I want to enjoy myself. And um, like I said, I'm, I'm gonna try to share with you whatever my thoughts are. Um, and I think that's the benefit to, to watching a demonstration is to hear, not just see, but also hear what the artist is thinking. Um, and I'll, let me just say up front, I'm not expecting um, that people are watching me in thinking, okay, that's the way to paint landscape, or that's not what I'm trying to project anyway. I'm not trying to say, this is how you ought to do it. This, I'm, what I'm saying is this is one way to do it. Okay, and I think you probably understand that, but I'll just, let me get that out there right away. There's many ways to paint, many ways to put down paint and make marks and uh, all kinds of different choices when it comes to your color that you choose on your palette. So. I'll let you know as I'm beginning what I have on my palette very quickly, and then uh, I'll start talking and, and walk us through. So what I'm gonna do, just to let you know, just for a second here, um, and I won't be in the picture while I'm painting, um, but I'm gonna square this up, okay? So I'm gonna move this camera, so just give me a second. I'm gonna slide a few things around. Are we ready to go, Jim? Everything good? Yes, we are. Okay, so bear with me, everybody, as I just situate this. Um, and I'm going to pull my chair around here. You won't see me or the chair. You'll see my arm coming into the painting. Hopefully that's it. Um, I'm going to square this up the best I can. Now I can't, I can't quite get the whole palette in and, and the board. Okay. So I think you understand that, that that's an issue but I'm trying to get some of that palette in, okay? All right, there we go. Looks good. All right, well, good. Well, first, first things first, uh, let me just start by saying I'm working on a, um, a masonite board and there was an old painting that I sanded down. Some of you probably do the same thing. Um, so I had a painting on here that didn't quite get to where I wanted it. Um, it kicked around the studio for a while, then I sanded it down. And 
What I put on top of the painting is um, a product made by Gamblin, Gamblin, excuse me, no D on the end, Gamblin, uh, called Oil Ground. Some of you are probably familiar with it. Uh, it's like an oil gesso. And, and I put a thin covering of that on there. And so you can see some of the old painting coming through and you can see some texture, I think. Um, and I, I happen to like this surface. So for me, this is a nice surface to work on. I, I don't, the, the, the uh, random texture uh, is something that I like. Um, and it's not a distraction for me. So every once in a while, my knee may hit this and may, may, may make the screen bounce a little, but I'll try to keep that to a minimum. Very quickly, I'll tell you what I have on my palette. I think you can see the colors here, most of them. Um, I have titanium white, I have yellow ochre, and I have a gray that I put out. It's Portland Gray Light by Gamblin. And um, I'll explain how I use that in this painting. It's a nice color if you have a lot of gray clouds to work with. It's not necessary, you can mix your own grays and often that's the best thing to do, but it's a nice clean gray that I can rely on and every time I go to it, it's the same, right? Because it's out of the tube. In other words, if I mixed my grays from a pile, you know, my script palette scrapings, which people do, oftentimes those, more well, those piles will change over time. So if I'm working on a painting for a long time and I'm going for grays, one, one time it might be kind of greenish, another time it might be a little stronger toward blue. So anyway, um, kind of an extra color, not necessary, but I like that. I also have a basic, what I would call a basic landscape palette where I have a warm and cool of each of the primary. So I have a cool yellow, which is my, which is lemon yellow. My warm yellow is cadmium yellow medium. And I'll use anything from cad yellow light to cad yellow medium. Sometimes I'll use cad yellow deep. So um, in case you're wondering, that'll change for me from time to time. But this is cad yellow medium. For my warm red, I have um, cadmium red light. And a cool red, I have rose matter deep, which is similar, but not the same as alizarin. Uh, one thing about the rose matter is it doesn't have a tendency to fade over time. And that's a, that can be an issue with alizarin. Uh, I have ultramarine blue, which is my warm blue. I have phthalo blue, which is my cool blue. Okay. I have burnt sienna, and I don't think you can see that. It's right down here. And I ha also have Payne's gray, which uh, looks like black. And, in, and for all intents and purposes, it is a black, but it's a very, uh, I use it mostly as a blue because um, I'm gonna dip into it and show you what it looks like. If I, if I take a little bit of this paint's gray and add some white to it and, and put it on this board, it's hard to, it's probably hard to tell, but it, it has a bit of a bluish tone to it. Um, it's not dirty, not real dirty looking. Um, again, I don't know how well that comes across just on the white there. Okay, so that's my palette. The only other thing I'll tell you, and um, again, this is gonna shake a little when I'm mixing, but um, the only other thing that I'm using that you might wanna know about is I'm using Liquin. And this is um, my medium and it's, it speeds up the drying time. Um, it makes the painting kind of a, a little bit semi-gloss when it's dry and it, it extends the paint. It makes it very loose and slippery. So I tend to like that. So that's, that's what I'm gonna use for my medium along with my um, odorless mineral spirits. Okay, so to begin with here, I have a 16 by 20, okay, and I have a rather simple scene, meaning that, you know, there's not a ton going on. There's a lot of busyness in the sky with the clouds, but there's not a lot, um, a lot of buildings or a lot of cars or a lot of things like that. I tend to like um, subjects that are 
rather organic and kind of wild. So that's why I chose this. I'm I, The focus will be on the cloud. So since it's a sky painting focus, I'm gonna think about putting my land down low, right? In other words, keep the, keep the land down here and have it be mostly sky as opposed to mostly land and a little bit of sky. And I'm starting with this large brush. It's a one and a half. And, and sometimes these brushes are referred to as spalters. And sometimes they're just referred to as, you know, just big flat brushes, but it has a nice long handle on it too. So what I'm mixing up right now is a little bit of my alizarin or excuse me, I said alizarin, I meant uh, the rose matter, a little bit of my ultramarine blue and just a, in a touch of my cad red light. I probably don't need the rose matter in there and then some white. What I'm trying to do is just mix sort of a purpley color. And I'm, what I'm gonna do with this is I'm gonna place the mountains across here and add just a touch of yellow ochre to that mixture, gray it out a little bit. Mix a little bit more paint here, and I'm and I'm adding a little white. The white lightens it and kind of cools it. Really, I'm just going for the rough size of those hills and their placement. So they're back in there, which again gives me mostly sky and just a little bit of land. What I spend a lot of time doing is cleaning my brush. So uh, you'll see me. Well, I guess you won't see me doing it, but I'm off to the side here and I'm cleaning my brush up. Now I'm going to add a little white and, uh, or I should say a little more white to this mixture. I'm going up into the sky now. And what I want is to just lay out the basic pattern for the clouds. Now, you're, if you all are landscape painters and you paint outside, you know, you know, clouds are constantly moving. Clouds are like waves, right? They're always moving. Um, and so you have to pick your moment when you want to paint the, you know, a pattern that you see with them. Either that or you take a photo and then you use parts of it, but you change other parts, meaning you don't have to copy everything in the photo just the way you see it. So I took this photo with a brain is what I like to say, meaning I chose my moment when I liked the way the clouds looked in the frame of the, of the um, camera. So I had already thought about basic, some basic design elements about the placement of the clouds. So I'm gonna follow the placement of these large clouds, the, the main clouds. I'm gonna put them pretty much where I see them in my reference photo. But again, that's because when I took the reference photo, I had already thought about that. You see, I thought about, is this a good composition? You know, are the clouds in a place that I would like to have them if I made a painting of this? And not everybody does that, right? Artists do that all the time. Folks who aren't artists, they might just, you know, snap a generalized photo. Maybe it has a decent design or maybe it, it doesn't. Um, but the other thing you always want to do is improve on the design. So that that's called editing, right? That falls under the, the heading of editing. 
So you're going to edit your reference photo. And editing basically means not putting things where they are, but, but putting them where they look nice or not making it the shape that it is, make it a shape that works well for the painting. Now, if you have a scene or a situation where the cloud is a wonderful shape and works great where it is, well, of course, you, that would be a great reason to leave it. But don't just assume that um, because it's on the in the photo that you have to copy it. The thing to remember is that it's a reference photo. And so you refer to it, right? You refer to the photo. You don't copy the photo. And I'm sure that you're all well aware of that, but I like to remind myself of that because when I'm inside, because I mostly work outside, when I'm inside, because it stays the same the whole time, it, the clouds are not moving because the image, you know, stay, stays uh, the same because it's a photo. I can, if I'm not careful, I can get too caught up in making a representation of every cloud in the painting, which really doesn't usually end up working very well in the end, because it starts to look a little too tight. It starts to look a little too um, stiff, I guess. Okay, so, so here's what I'm thinking about, by the way. So in, right away, I'm thinking about values. And I have light, the clouds have a light side and a shadow side. So I need to make the most of that and get a nice light for my light side of the clouds and get a nice, you know, dark for the shadow side. And the other thing I need to do as I'm moving along is take note of all of the temperature shifts and then meaning, you know, some parts of the cloud seem to go a little bit more blue, other parts seem to go a little more purple on the dark side. And the, then I also need to, in the end, I'm, I need to make these clouds look like they float because clouds are soft. So I, I have to convince the viewer that these things aren't made of stone or marble. You can see I'm scrubbing around with this brush an awful lot. And I'm continuing to dip into my liquid. Now, as the sky comes down here to the, lo the lower part here, as I look at my reference, I notice that it has a little different color to the blue there. So what I'm going to do, it looks a little bit greener. I'm going to dip into my phthalo blue. The ultramarine has kind of a red in it, okay, the, a reddish blue. This is, the phthalo has kind of a cool yellow. To it, so it kind of it kind of looks kind of greenish. I'm gonna throw that in there. The other thing I should say is, for me, nothing is finished. You know, at any point, especially at this point. But the painting itself is going to be what what um, I like to refer to as a series of corrections as I go along. So I, I'm starting trying to get the rough shape in the correct color family. And then the considerations about the color that I'm most interested in are what is the value of that color, meaning how light and dark is that color? And then how warm and cool is that color? And of course, no color on its own is light or dark or warm or cool. It's all about how it relates to the other colors. 
in the painting. So because of that, I'm working the whole painting at the same time. So you'll see me jumping around, work here a little bit, then over here, then back down in the land, and so on and so forth. So what I'm, again, what I'm looking for in the sky is I'm looking to see, well, is this area of cloud, does it, does it look like it has um, a little more red in it uh, than, than this part of the cloud up here? Um, because my eye seems to tell me that. So then I sort of, squint and I look and I compare and I would say, yes, it does. It has more red. So I'm pushing some red into that. And I'm using my cadmium red light for that. And then as I come up here, if I look at the bottom of this cloud, not the very dark, but the middle tone, it seems to have a little more red in it as well. It's a little darker here than it is here. This probably needs to go a little bit lighter, but this definitely needs needed to go a little bit darker. So that's why I was darkening that just a touch. And I'm staying in the clouds here. I'm staying largely in the red blue family, right? So I'm in my purples and you know, why is that? Well, that's because when I look at, at this sky and I squint down, that's largely what's going on in the sky. That's the color family that I think that I'm in. I'm in that purple color family, which is of course the red and the blue family, a mixture of the both of them. But as I go on, I will tip little bits of uh, yellow into that. So we'll, we'll get some little green notes here and there. And we'll get some warmer notes. I'm, I'm gonna, for that, I'm gonna use my a little bit of yellow ochre. Come up here and warm this up a little bit. I'm warming this a little more then I see it out there, but I'm doing that for a reason. The clouds as they come up overhead, meaning up this, the clouds are kind of coming up like this and over. That's, that's what's happening here. And these clouds here are reflecting more of what's on the land. There's a lot of warmth on the land. These clouds back here are reflecting more of the distant hills and things. Um, and they're also the atmosphere between, between where I'm standing and here is a lot, there's a lot more distance than between here and here. So you're not seeing the yellow so much back in here, but you're seeing them here again, they're reflecting, um, the earth. So before I go too far, I'd like to come in here and place some color on here it's, and cover the whole board. I'd like to place some ground cover. I've pushed that a little bit more yellow than it is and that's okay. Because I can adjust it, right? I can, you know, this series of corrections idea. That was a little drip came down from the clouds. I'm gonna reach across the camera here and grab some more of my white paint. Okay, and with the hills, I'm also because the hills are at a distance. I'm also in the red and blue family, primarily. There will not be much yellow in that mixture at all, if any. 
So be careful if you're painting hills and you think you see, you know, green trees. Um, a really nice thing to do, especially if you're outdoors is, uh, I'm gonna hold this up. Hold your arm at full length and isolate the, the color, the, hill, the hills in the distance. Look at that color through that hole real quickly. It doesn't work so well um, in the studio um, when you have an image that's projected or a photo, but when you're outside, it really helps. And what, what, it, what you'll notice when you do that is the, these hills in the back will be bluer and lighter uh, than, you, than you think. In other words, they won't have much yellow in them, even if they're covered in green trees. And that's the and that's because of the atmospheric perspective, right? Um, you've all read about that in John Carlson's book, I'm sure. But the yellows drop out first, and then the reds drop out, and that's why things that are if you can get anywhere where you can see a long, long distance, the hills furthest away look blue, and it's not because they're they have you know they they're actually blue. It's just because the color doesn't. Um, the only color that gets through is the blue at that range, the yellows and reds have dropped out. Dropping in a little bit more blue there. I think I'm going to move this bag over here so I don't have to keep crossing over when I'm throwing my trash away. Throw it on the other side. Okay, I'm going to drop down onto the land here. And that's where I do have some green on the ground cover. I'll lay it in just a touch darker than it is. It's not a problem because I can go right over it. So I'm getting some of that in there. Again, I'm still using this large brush. You can, you can see that. What I have within this ground plane, I have these little washes that are kind of going back and in, and they're important. <clears throat> I need something to help lead the eye through the painting. And what it will end up being really is just a series of, you know, light and dark marks. Something just to keep this from being all one flat shape. Got my palette knife here. Often what I do is I'll put my paint on with the brush and then I'll sort of float the knife over areas with the palette knife, just, just to change things up a little bit and change the paint quality a little bit. Um, so part of what I'm doing is I'm just trying to stay interested in the painting. And the other thing that I'm thinking about is that one of the things that we all like is we like variety. And so variety in mark making can be very helpful, you know, in a painting. It can be a really nice thing. So I'm thinking about that, not just variety in the shape making or variety in the values and the temperatures, but also, again, also the 
variety in the mark making. And I have all kinds of tools, and I guess not that many, but I've got these big palette knives that I may, I may pull that one out at some point. I've got, you know, this is even a larger one. Mostly those I use on even larger paintings. I have a number of different brushes. I also have these little, are you all familiar with these? This is uh, made by a company called Catalyst, I guess is the company. Anyway, it's, it's the same material that your rubber spatula is made out of. I think initially these were made for sculptors, but they work great for painting. Um, for manipulating paint and a lot of folks are using them nowadays and I, I like to use those from time to time. I had a little bit of my paint there contaminated the brush so I didn't want that strong red on there. Apologize for my squeaky chair. That's what you're hearing when I move. I want to put a little bit of the blue sky in here. And for that, initially I'm, I'm using the phthalo blue. I'm now I'm adding a little bit of the ultramarine to it. And I'm putting it kind of where I see it here, roughly. And one thing I know about the blue is as it goes down toward the horizon, it gets lighter. It goes more, more kind of a robin's egg blue. But I am having a little trouble here because my white is so contaminated that I'm going to have to put some fresh white out. Okay, so I'm still building the whole painting and I'm still looking at the process as a, um, a series of corrections, meaning I've got something down now. Now I have to try to get the shapes a little more accurate, um, get the light and dark a little more accurate, get the edges a little more varied. So I have nice soft edges in places and a little bit uh, harder edges in other places. There is a bit of some blue sky over here uh, that I want to make sure I put in there. I'm gonna come down here and work on these hills a little bit. So again, you know, kind of back and forth, back and forth.
And one thing you can't see that I'm doing is I'm squinting when I look at my image. And I'm sure, again, you're all familiar with that. You know, then the reason for that is you can see the value shifts a little more accurately and it keeps you from seeing too much detail. So for the type of painting that I'm doing, and maybe you all are doing this type as well, is what I refer to as painterly painting, um, impressionist painting, expressive painting. Um, I'm not concerned with detail. Uh, I'll have a minimal amount of detail in my painting, mostly concerned with shape relationship, temperature relationship, and of course value relationship. So I'm warming up little parts of these hills where the, the sun is hitting these really dry cliffs and, and things. But I need to be careful um, that I don't see, again, that I don't see too much yellow back at that distance. Um, if you're not, again, if you're not careful, you, you'll tend to see a lot of yellow and that if you put strong yellow back here, it wants to jump forward in the composition or, you know, in the picture, I mean, and, and that's a problem. Um, so I'm being careful, not to get too high chroma at all with, with any yellow back there. I'm going to jump up to my, my clouds again. And I think what I'm going to do, excuse me, as I reach over here, I'm going to grab this tool that I talked about. And I'm going to kind of float it over parts of the clouds because they're starting to look like they, they um, like some of the uh, brushwork is a little bit distracting. So I'd like to flatten that down a little bit. Use the knife as well, just kind of do the same thing, kind of floating the knife here. And now I can go in and continue, you know, building these values and shapes again. The way I like to describe my painting process is draw it, stain it, and pile on paint. So the drawing phase, the drawing that I'm talking about is shape drawing, but there's a little bit of linear drawing in the beginning, the placement of things sometimes. But the reason I like to think about it that way is even though I like a nice, um, heavy application of paint a lot in a painting, I try to reserve any heavy, heavy application of paint until the end. Uh, try to, or until I've actually established the drawing to, a, you know, where I like it. So at some point I realized that that was a helpful way for me to think about the process is so that I don't jump the gun and start diving in with real thick paint early. I like to remind myself to be in that sort of the drawing phase and then the staining phase. Again, that's just kind of these thinner washes of value. And then toward the end, that's when I begin to put the thicker paint on if I need it. 
Um, in some paintings, we'll, you won't need very thick paint. But the other thing that I do, I learned from Helen Van Wyck. And if you've been around for a little while, you'll remember that she used to have a painting show on TV. She also has a lot of books released. And I remember back in the early 80s, I was watching her on TV and she talked about a process of painting objects. She was painting a flower. And she, the, what she said was, I'll make the flower. So she put a rough shape for the flower, kind of like maybe I did for the cloud. Then I'll break the flower. So she'll then she'll come in with the background and then she'll and sort of break the edges of what she has and then she'll make the flower again. So. So she would be constantly working back and forth instead of drawing something out carefully and coloring in the line. So I'll try to show you with the cloud here. So, you know, I kind of make the cloud with the cloud shade and then I kind of break it by coming in with maybe a darker value in this case that represents the, the dark side of the cloud, you know, where it's going into shadow. But maybe I break that up over into the light side just a little bit more um, than is necessary. And then I'll come in with the light again, which I'll do that in a minute here. And I'll lay that light on and kind of push that back into the dark. So I'm kind of knitting the painting together and I can create nice soft edges that way. Sometimes you can do it with a knife too. You can begin to bring this back over, but you see you're, you're, um, you're not in danger or I'm not in danger here of coloring in a drawing. So nothing is too precious. So also goes to what I said about painting being a series of corrections, right? So there's a lot of correcting going on. The reason I share this with you is if you can sort of know this as a process, um, it allows you not to get frustrated sometimes when and think that you have to draw it in perfectly the first time. And if you don't get it, then the whole painting isn't, you know, it's lost. Really, this approach is lends itself to a you know a nice kind of sophisticated look in the end. If you're if you again if you're working back and forth and back and forth, and that's what I'm hoping to get out of it. So you can see I took some paint off of there, but I'm not I'm not worried about it. I know again that this is a process and that I'm following a way of painting that's comfortable to me, meaning this sort of back and forth, back and forth. I'm trying to be done as soon as possible, meaning I'd rather not you know, work on the painting for hours on end, but I'm also allowing for things to happen here, right? So I'm not, I'm not control overly controlling every mark that I make. I'm allowing I'm allowing the paint to mix on the canvas or on the board here and create um, kind of nice little passages. I'm feeling like I need to soften this all out some more. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Remember I said clouds need to be soft. So I'll go ahead and keep it nice and soft. I'll lose some of what I had, but hopefully I can get that all back. Here's a time when I'll take this big knife, kind of pull it across there, pull it across there. Pull that. A little bit of blue in there, which 
I didn't intend to, but again, this is a process, so. And that's what I wanna show um, in this, with this demo is the process um, of working back and forth. I'm gonna grab, excuse me for getting in the way of the camera there, but I'm gonna grab my other brush here. My bigger brush. Come back here. One thing about this scene is the clouds you know, like they're really soft and rather torn up in a lot of places. Um, just a really beautiful, beautiful cloudscape. So here I am going back and forth some more, okay? So I suppose for some of you that makes you feel uneasy. But I don't know the direction the painting is going to go in when I start it. I don't know how fast I will get to a finish. So what I need to do right now is I need to take a minute and, and clean off my palette. So I'm gonna do that. I've run out of mixing space and I need to get some nice clean color. I wanna place the, the clean white of the clouds. I know that's bouncing back and forth a little bit. Eric, would you like me to show the reference photo again? I'd love that. That's terrific. That'd be terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. There it is. Beautiful clouds, boy. So keep in mind, I don't, I'm not copying, right? I'm, plus my format is slightly different than the format of the reference photo, isn't it? I have, Mine's a 16 by 20. That, that's a little bit more of a horizontal format. Um, so I'm just grabbing part of that image. And I'm reaching over to get my lip wind. Here we go. Okay. And a little more white paint as well. I have to reload my paint here. I'm running low on blue and red. And I was running low on white, of course. Thank you for showing that um, image again there, Jim. It's great. There, there is a question in chat here. Yeah. Uh, Angelina says, it looks great. It's nice to see a side-by-side -side comparison. So I guess that's from showing the reference photo. Oh, good, good. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, we'll make sure we show that again, won't we? At some point, we'll show that uh, reference again, Jim. Sure. So what I'm gonna do now I want to get the white of these clouds. And as we know, nothing in nature is pure white. So what we have is a cloud that we'll call white. And it has 
warm sunlight on it, warm yellow sunlight. So that's my mixture. That's my recipe is um, white with a little bit of my cadmium yellow medium in there. So that's what I'm doing here. Just mixing that. Put a little bit of red in it as it comes over here. A little bit of red down here. Again, I remember I talked about seeing a little more red down in here as well. It's amazing what you can do with just, you know, just your simple primary colors, you can begin to basically get every color, you know, that you need here in the sky. I mean, you don't need, my point is you don't need any fancy um, purples or any, um, any real, any, any crazy reds or anything, you know, you can just go with your, just a basic CAD red light for the most part mixed with blue. At this point, I'm going to start thinking about um, I've got a hair in there, hair in the brush. Uh, I'm going to start thinking about making these clouds the shapes that I think I want to see them. In other words, what do I think works best for the composition here as opposed to make, trying to copy them? So I like to go with what's there. Um, mostly, like in other words, I like to let my editing be kind of minor, but sometimes um, you need to make some bigger changes, meaning, for instance, you know, changing the shape of a cloud so that it's just more interesting for the painting because no one is ever going to call you out and say, well, that cloud didn't look like that because, you know, they won't know. You just have to make it flow and give it the character of the type of cloud that you were looking at, right? So I think that's something that's, I didn't know when I started painting, um, I didn't know that. I thought that people went out and painted what was in front of them and that if you couldn't do that, somehow you, were, you weren't an artist or you weren't a good artist. Um, I think that a talented artist, a good artist, or someone who's worked a long time ought to be able to get pretty close to what's there, right? If they have to. But you you don't want to copy just, just for the sake of, you know, saying that you copied it. In other words, if it if you can make a better composition or get a better feeling to your painting, um, and that involves not copying everything that you're seeing, then that's a better thing. You know, that's better for, again, for the painting in the long run. So again, I, I, what I was saying was when I first started painting, I thought that everybody painted exactly what was there. You know, in other words, if there's four trees, three bushes, seven daffodils, two caterpillars, five fence posts, one biplane, you know, like I thought it all was supposed to go in. I didn't realize that, no, you, there's editing involved and you can, you can pick and choose what you decide to keep in and what you decide to keep out. Maybe only one caterpillar would be best, right? You know, Of course, I'm kidding around about the caterpillar, but you know what I mean. Maybe only three trees would be maybe three trees instead of five trees, or instead, of, you know, maybe all of the trees are the exact same height. 
when you're looking at them, but maybe it'd be better. And they're all, they're all equidistant from each other. Maybe you group a few of them together and change the height of one of them so that they don't all look the same, right? Those, those kind of considerations. I'm seeing a little bit of green in that hill back there, but I'm keeping it very gray. I, and I, the, the yellow that I used to go for that is yellow ochre. I didn't go for my high chroma yellow for my cadmiums. I stayed away from my cadmiums. So really all I'm accountable for and all you're accountable for is to make marks, shapes with color on your panel or your canvas that relate properly to the other marks on, the, on your canvas or panel, right? You're not responsible for copying color for color, tone for tone, shape for shape. And um, I need to be careful because what I'd like to create here is something that works here. Uh, again, not necessarily something that captures every nuance that I see in the reference. So I'm continuing to move around here, aren't I? And what I'm asking myself as I'm mixing paint is I'm looking up and let's say I'm looking up uh, at the dark part of, the, of a cloud and I'm asking myself, is the dark part of that cloud that I'm looking at, is it lighter or darker than another dark part, you know, in the sky, another part of a cloud? Or is it, is it warmer or cooler than what's next to it? So I'm trying to find relationships that work. And if I follow that thinking and that question and answer, kind of boring question and answer over and over from the start of the painting to the finish of the painting, I'll end up with something that makes sense. You know, I still, I still may not have the best painting in the world. Maybe I need help with my uh, edges or um, or any number of other things, but I'll begin to get the relationships re um, in a correct relation to one to one another. Eric, we have another question. Yeah, this, this is from Rishab. How can I paint on a limited budget? How many and what colors would be sufficient for a beginner? Well, I like the question. I'm gonna I'm gonna pause for a second and, and answer that. Um, what I would do is I would use paints that aren't very expensive. So here's an example. I've been using Winton lately because because right now the price of paint has gone way up. <clears throat> if you're in if you're using oil paint. Winton isn't a bad brand. There's a bunch of cheaper brands. I'm holding it at an angle so you can read it because if I hold it like that, you can't. But um, So I would say go with some of the cheaper brands, but what you have to know is that sometimes or most of the time they don't have as much pigment in them. So they might not, the colors might not be as rich as a more expensive color, but it really shouldn't matter. Um, you can learn to use any paint is my feeling, even the cheapest paint. And as far as what colors to buy, I would consider going with a very limited palette. You, if you want to, you can go as limited as one yellow, one red, one blue and white. And maybe you might want a burnt sienna 
something, you know, um, something like that, just, just to make a deep, dark, warm brown. Um, and what I will tell you is that over the years, there's been a lot of manufacturers that have come up with alternatives to cadmium because you're going to find that those will be your most expensive colors. I'm sure you're aware of that and everyone else is too. They're just crazy. So I think this, this tube right here in a lot of brands, this, this is my cadmium yellow medium pure a lot in, in a lot of different brands, this is like 80 or $90 a tube. I, I think this one may have been 40 something, which is still a lot of money, but you can get, um, you can get cadmium alternatives like naphthol red, for example, works great and it's not cadmium uh, and it's, it's much cheaper. Hansa yellow is much cheaper. So I would look to those things, um, those colors. And as far as what you're painting on for surface, um, if you bought, you can buy, you, I'm sure you're aware of the um, canvas panels, right? Uh, like the Fredericks and there's a lot of cheap brands you can buy. Blick makes some and you can buy those packets. But what I like to do is I take my, my palette knife and I'm, I'm going to hold my leg up here like, and I scrape across it like this, not like this, but like this. And I, and I scrape sort of, the, it's kind of like a shark tooth um, surface to it, very rough. I do that and then I paint on it and it's smoother. And I like it better. The other option is you can get a, a cheap tub of um, student grade gesso and put another coat of paint on it. And it'll be a nicer surface for you than what they sell, you know, right out of the package. Um, I hope that's helpful. I don't have all the answers on all of this, but that's, that's my take on it. Um, and I too do cheap things. So I make all my own boards. I don't buy them. I buy masonite and I have a table saw, which I understand not everybody has or not everyone is comfortable with, but I cut my own boards and I put, I use cheap gesso. When I say cheap gesso, I mean student grade acrylic gesso. And the reason I use it is I actually like it. I like how it's absorbent and all that, um, but it's also cheap. Please have a follow-up to that um, if, if that didn't answer your question. But Nisa is saying here, Ross has cheap art supplies. Oh, is that right? I don't think we have Ross near me out here, but if you have that, that's great. That's, that's great information. I would say, yeah, talk to your friends and talk to fellow painters in your area. See what they're using and where they're getting getting their their paint their brushes all of that brushes are crazy too um so i've been using these simply simmons uh, i don't know if you can read that but they're not very expensive and they last pretty well and i don't take care of my brushes i mean i'm, I'm hard on them i should say so your question was a really um good question i'm glad you asked it um, because I too have trouble, uh, like I said, with all of these expenses, it's just so expensive anymore that I do everything I can to keep the cost down. The other thing is instead of buying cups, you know, that you can buy little nice little turp cups, obviously use a tuna can. If, if you eat tuna and you have those little metal cans, they're great for solvent. Um, you know, I'm sure, again, I'm sure all of you do that. Yogurt containers, whatever you need to do. Thanks for putting up with the squeaky chair, everybody. It's funny teaching to nobody. <laughs> like, I know you're there, but it's, it's funny. Um, I'm used to a lot of interaction. I just taught a workshop in Florida in person and um, had, had a lot of fun, you know. And it, it's easier to read the room. So the hard part for me here is I can't read the room. Like sometimes you realize, oh, maybe I should just shut up, you know, shut my mouth and paint. But I can't tell that now. So if you're thinking that, I'm sorry, I'm going on and on.
I'm going to drop down to the land here. I'm still squinting when I look at my um, when I look up and I, I'm comparing values. So I I look up and I see that this ground plane is in the green family. So that's all I need to know. And then I need to ask, well, how light or dark is that green compared to other colors around it? And how warm or cool is it? And I need to try to get that relationship as close as I can. And then I can see different parts of this uh, ground plane that are a little lighter maybe and a little bit warmer or a little bit cooler than other parts. So I kind of go for that. What I'd like to get is this feeling of the light hitting the land. There's, because of the clouds, the way they are, the parts of the land are in shadow and other parts are, are in, in light. So Rishabh has another question. Um, Yay, I'm ready, I think. If I don't know, by the way, if I don't have a good answer for you, I won't make it up. Well, he did say thanks. This is very helpful to the previous question. Uh, but he now asks, uh, when you t when you have a reference photo, how do you decide on the canvas size? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, it's a very, very good question. And the reason why is, um, I'll just start from the beginning about canvas size. Your, your first compositional decision or your first desi design decision is format. Is it going to be? Uh, horizontal, vertical, square, and what size? Is it going to be a six by eight? Is it going to be an 18 by 24, whatever? So what I had a professor um, in college who said to me at one time, and, and I had never thought of this before he mentioned it. And I remember when he mentioned it, he was looking at a bunch of my paintings. And I he was thinking that some of my paintings looked like they ought to go a little larger. And maybe some of them maybe maybe would, would be better smaller, but he said to me, he said, um, don't you think that every view or every, every landscape has its own size that it wants to be? And I thought about that and thought, oh, that's a really good way to think about it. Um, it doesn't mean that there's only one format that, should, that, that anybody should paint a certain scene. It means maybe for you, for the way you're thinking and approaching the landscape and what you want to say about it, there might be a size that works best. So I like to, for instance, um, these Western scenes, like what I'm doing here, this Tao scene, a lot of those scenes to me look like they would work really well in a one by two format, meaning twice as wide as it is tall. So 10 by 20, okay, 12 by 24, so on and so forth, right? Um, but when I go to choose a size to paint, very often um, it's just a gut sort of intuitive feeling about what I want to include in the scene that I'm looking at. Do I think it works best in a more, um, in a 16 by 20, for instance, uh, or does it, does it work better in the 18, 18 by 24? That's they're close in size, but 18 by 24 is a little bit more horizontal than it is tall. The 16 by 20 is going a little bit more towards square, just a touch, okay? I don't know if that is helpful or not, um, but those are things that I think about. I'm looking up here, by the way, um, keep asking questions. I would, I'm happy to answer them. Please know, I don't think of myself as the one with all the answers, but I'm glad to share anything that I, um, that I might, any thoughts I might have about it. And if I, if, if I don't have a thought about it or haven't thought about it, you can trust me that I'll just say, I haven't never thought of that. You know, I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm adding, there's some little, clouds, some of them are a little bit, they have some warmth to them, but it's very, they're very grayed down, the clouds, meaning they don't belong in any one color family really strongly. In other words, they're not strong blue or strong red or strong yellow. They're, they're gray. And by the way, um, 
nature is mostly grays, isn't it? In other words, it's not right out of the tube colors. The only time you might start getting into that is if you're dealing with maybe the color of a bright boat or flowers are a good, good example where they might be, they're very high chroma reds and yellows and oranges, and so on and so forth. But, um, but a natural scene like this is, a, is very grayed down. Hey, we have another question from Angelina. Okay. Traditionally, is it best to start a painting with darker colors and build up to lighter colors? Yeah. Um, oil painters, acrylic painters, uh, gouache painters, anybody who's dealing with um, opaque colors, the general tried and true approach is to work from dark to light. And the reason for that is if you're starting with a white white canvas, if I go in for the, the light cloud first, let's just use this as an example. I, I can't tell how light I am because it's up against white. So in other words, the, the general rule is if you want to have light, you need to have dark. So getting some dark down um, provides some steps for you to go lighter, right? And, and start to bring life and form to your painting. Now, if you're painting in, um, in watercolor, it's the other way around. You sort of start by knowing where you're gonna reserve your lights, right? Um, and then you go from light to dark. But since I'm not doing watercolor, uh, I'm following the dark to light. And you can test that. Anything I'm saying, test it. Look what other people have said about it. You know, you can break any rule that you want is my feeling, but um, there's probably good reasons why it's easier to work from dark to light than the other way around. But like I said, you know, try other, try other ways if you want or break rules whenever you want, whatever works for you. So you see what I'm doing now is it's these little dots and dashes. So it's these light dots against the dark area that give interest. And when I look up at my reference photo, what I'm seeing is areas where there's predominantly dark, but maybe a little bit of a light bleeding in. And then there might be other areas. Um, I don't see, I haven't put any yet where there's a predominant light and maybe, it, well, like this, here's a predominant light and I've put this little dark cloud coming across here, which that dark cloud is actually in my reference photo. I haven't painted it exactly the same shape and size um, or put it in the exact same place that it's in, in the reference photo, but I have included it because I like a dark against the light. In the same reason here, I like the light against the dark. One other thing that I sort of came to realize that I like about paintings, I like a lot of the Russian painters, um, and I'm from New England originally, um, and I live here now as well, but I lived out in Oregon for 20 something years. Um, but my influences are a lot of these gutsy New England painters and a lot of the Russian painters. And what I noticed about their mark making was they had what I have come to refer to as mass, like this is an area that's massed in, line, which is sort of these kind of strokes, right? Even that, you know, kind of linear, linear strokes in a painting. This one's a linear stroke and dot, okay? These little dots and dashes, these light dots against dark and dark against light. And so I try to go forward with my mark making. And sometimes I'll ask myself, at a certain point in the painting, you know, do I have enough straights in this painting? Or am I all, uh, am I all mass and little dots? Or am I all organic and not enough, you know, of a, of a straight line? And, and the reason is that 
variety is nice. We like variety and having all of the same mark anywhere, uh, everywhere in a painting wouldn't be a good recipe for an interesting painting to look at or live with. So Eric, we have another question. Yeah. This one is from Andrea. What's the difference in term, terms of outcome between acrylic and oil painting? What would you recommend for beginners to start with? Well, that's a great question. Um, let, let me just, let me say this. Um, acrylic, let me think for a second. There's difficulties for both. Um, let me start by talking about what some of the difficulties are. I'll start with the oil. The difficulty with oil uh, is that, well, well, the nice thing about it is you can change and move anything, right? Constantly, um, very easily. But the, but the difficulty or one of the um, hard things about oil is if you're, if you're not careful, you can end up with muddy color, right? Because you can work and work and overwork and all of a sudden all your colors start to, they don't stay separated temperature wise. They start to all get toward this middle gooey gray color. So you have to be careful with oil because it can get really messy. Um, acrylic, you can stay nice and clean because you can lay a flat color over an area that's already dry. But one of the difficulties with acrylic um, is edges because um, it's hard to get nice soft edges. The other thing with acrylic is acrylics tend to dry a little bit darker than you put them down. So you can have issues where your paintings can look a little dull and a little dark. So having said that, I started in oils and I went to acrylic later. Um, I don't think there's any reason why you couldn't start with acrylic or oil or, you know, have one or the other work best for you. I don't know. I can't speak for everybody. Like what if you might try acrylic and just absolutely love it. Um, it. Or you might try oil and absolutely love it and not like acrylic. So that sounds like a, a politician answer but I'm just trying to give you my thoughts on it from my experience. Um, I'm trying to think if I wanna even encourage you one way or the other. I, th I think I would encourage someone to go to oil first. I know that may go against what other people will say, but the reason is you can, like I said, you can change things, you can modify edges, and it forces you to really keep everything really nice and clean because you can't just go over and fix it. And it also forces you to work from thin to thick because it won't dry. If you go on really thick and you start getting in the habit of doing that with acrylics, that again, it works for acrylics, but if you ever go over to oils, you're going to have trouble. And I don't, I don't know which is cheaper. I, I have a feeling you can probably get cheap acrylics that are cheaper than cheap oils because I buy cheap acrylics, but I haven't, I haven't priced them out to know exactly what the price difference might be. I guess another consideration might be if you go with acrylic, you don't have to buy mineral spirits. So if, if price is at all an issue, there's a plus for the, the acrylics. I'm going to take my knife again and I'm going to float it. Just across there and across here too.
Do you have a follow-up question? Sure. How do you keep oil painting from muddy color? From muddy color? Yes. Yeah, the, the um, I guess the answer to that would be be intentional about your mixing. And if you have to use separate brushes, a brush for your light, warm lights and a brush for your darks. Um, other than that would be washing your brush off in which you can't see me doing that, but I'm doing that often um, off camera here. And make the other thing is keep your, keep a nice separation between the light side and the shadow side of your painting. So in other words, realize that no matter what situation you're in, when you're painting a landscape, you, you, you have a light side and a shadow side. If it's, you know, especially if it's sunny, you have a, a light side and a shadow side. So every time your brush hits the canvas, you're either on the light side or the shadow side, right? So what I mean by that is, so then mix accordingly. So just be careful that you're never um, putting too much warmth on your shadow side and too much cool on your light side. So keep those two separate. The questions keep coming. Here's another one for Good. How do you store your oil paintings after they dry if you have more than your wall space to hang them? Oh yeah, um, I have them leaning up against each other by the hundreds in my studio and they're dry, they're sufficiently dry. So they're not, um, you know, th th that's not the problem. So that's what I do um, and everybody who I, associate with who is a painter uh, does that as well you know they have them just kind of somewhere whether they're in a storage closet or somewhere in their studio um but yeah that's always an issue because you're going to end if you if you you know if you get hooked on painting you're going to have more paintings than you know what to do with I'm going in and softening some edges here and I'm, I'm going to come back in and, and change some of this, but you can see even at this stage of the painting, I'm changing things. I'm trying this, I'm trying that. Um, again, I don't mind doing any of that. I, I, uh, I kind of like it. And if I, you know, I come in here and I lose this, you know, it doesn't look as good as it did before. Um, that's all right. Um, because somehow I just felt like it needed something and it's better for me to go ahead in and go for it and try to make it better than to just settle for yeah that's all right you know so that that's my feeling anyway so I'm coming in now with a palette knife to let me see if I can Good questions, by the way. And um, like I said, I don't have I don't have all the answers, but um, I know what I do anyway. Okay. Another question from Andrea. Yes. Does, does it matter what color to paint over the canvas for the first layer? I heard traditionally people put yellow color as a first layer. Yeah, yellow is very popular. Um, that works just great. Um, do, I'm assuming you mean, uh, do you mean, I'm, I'm not sure if you mean as a tone or if you mean as what color to draw in with. Um, but as a tone, yellow is great. Uh, people use burnt sienna. Um, I like to use sometimes kind of a pinky color. But 
a lot of times it depends on what I'm going to paint. And if I'm painting a still life, I like to use um, a, a nice blue. Excuse me for going in front of the camera there. I'm purposely breaking this up so that I can go back in and show you again the process of this building over and over. Um, and as far as the, if you're talking about drawing in, you know, what color to draw in with, that's probably just whatever you're comfortable with that isn't distracting for you. So Helen has kind of a follow-up question. Yeah. I found my paintings stuck together when they lean on each other. Oh, uh, yeah. When I, when I separated them, some colors came off. Would applying varnish help protect it? They have all been dry for years. Oh, wow. Um, I'm not sure. That's a good question. And I and I don't have a, an answer for you because I don't know if the varnish would then be sticky. You see, I mean, I, it would seal the painting, but I don't know if it would also be sticky. It's I just I just don't know um, about that. But I, I do know. I have had that happen before when when my paintings, they, they've been dried for a long time and they it's when they've been pressed together like a weight, kind of like there was a bunch of paintings stacked and um, the weight of the paintings caused them, I think, to kind of stick together. So I'm sorry that happened um, to your paintings. Um, and I'm sorry also that I don't know about the answer about using the varnish. I somehow don't think that'll make a whole lot of difference. So I'm going back in here and I'm just repainting and having fun. And I'm just going to kind of show you the process of if you wanted to, you know, lose part of a painting and then build it again. I like the process part of this. Um, we have time here. I don't have to like try to make a, I'm not, try, by, by the way, I'm not here to make a perfect painting. I, I, um, I'm i here to walk through process and being willing to play and try things and move things and, and all of that. So that's what I'm gonna be doing. And that's how I do my demos. Um, so I'm going to come over here. This. So Eric, just a time check. We have about 25 minutes left. Great. Okay. Thank you. I'm trying to make this a little more exciting. So you can see I'm breaking the painting again. When I say breaking it, I mean, I'm, I'm coming in and I'm losing what I had. And um, I know sometimes that makes people nervous. Um, it's something that I do on a regular basis, on a, on a daily basis, pretty much. Um, so it doesn't bother me. And I wanna be true with you about my process, not because I think that you need to paint like me, but just so you can see if you see my paintings anywhere, you can kind of know maybe how they came about. I mean, I could make a nice safe painting here and just kind of dial something in and have it be good, you know, good enough, but I'd rather be more playful. So Angelina says, I've always wanted to use oil paints, but I'm equally afraid of proper storage of the toxic chemicals. Can mm. you a brief walkthrough of how to store and dispose of the chemicals? That's a difficult one. Um, 
the they're toxic to breathe uh right you know to some degree at not just you know having them around but when you're using them so um yeah that's you know i would say you need to have a room or a building that's set aside for painting and have it ventilated properly meaning have some kind of an air vent um if you possible having a i think you've all been in studios where they have a place for you to to pour off your turps into a some some kind of a container that can be sealed right so so it's not off gassing into your studio at all times um so i would want that at the very least. And then if you have the money to buy from people like Gamblin, which is a really good company and you, you know, use their Gamsol product, um, which is non-toxic and doesn't off gas a lot, right? Things like that. Um, and their paints as well um, are less toxic than a lot of other brands. I won't say they're non-toxic because I mean, you don't want to eat the cadmium or anything, but. So I have a question for you, Eric. Yeah. Do you have any experience with water-based oils? A little bit, um, not, not much. I don't use them, but I have friends who use them. And when I'm teaching, sometimes people have them and I'll end up using, you know, using them. Like just last week, I was using them uh, when I was teaching in Florida uh, because a gal had them. So um, I'm not sure what your question is about them, but I have tried them. Well, it would it would just be as a follow on to the previous previous question about toxicity. Uh, I would oh think they yeah, would be less toxic. Yeah, I would think they're a lot less less toxic. And the nice thing is you don't have to have the um, terps, right? Right. Yeah, that's a good point, uh, Jim. Yeah, that's a good, really good point. And I, I think they work fine. They're a little bit different. So I'm changing some things here, but I'm having fun. And what I'm trying to do is lighten this cloud, light or lighten these clouds properly, because I, I haven't had them quite light enough. So um I've got a little bit of green coming in here, but that doesn't really bother me. Um, so what's fun is I'm really pushing the paint and I'm painting, I'm not coloring you know, in the lines, I'm pushing back and forth and trying all kinds of stuff. Now I'm going to come over here and get this darker, darker cloud put in here. Get this darker cloud in here. So I think what happened was I was starting to draw everything out and I was feeling like it was getting a little too tight for me. And I know maybe it, did, it might, I don't know if it looked too tight, but I feel like I wanted to break it all down again and start to find these shapes again and try to be a little bit more painterly with them. So going back to a little bit of green that you put in the in the sky there, uh, yeah. Theo asks, what about using some of the land spring green in the sky to tie them together? Yeah, that's exactly. You know, it's funny. I'm seeing that in areas like up in here. 
that's where that's coming from, I think. But they, that's a really great point. That's exactly, I think, why I'm I'm responding to it. It's, it's not one of those colors that's really loud. It's like it takes an artist's eye to see it. But um, that was that's a great thing to look to do. And um, I'm glad that that you brought that up. And so that's pretty much, I think, what I'm responding to is a way to tie that together. Um, and even up in here and over here as well. And you put a little bit of yellow ochre in there as well to, because the land has a warmth to it too. Not just the green, but I mean a um, kind of an earthy, dry. Now I'm going to come back over here. So I'm using a loaded brush here, very loaded. And what I'm hoping is that that will come across as confident and just have a nice look to the painting, partly because of the fact that I'm using a loaded brush. There's a great quote by Emil Gruppi, who is a New England painter, he said that a confident stroke in the wrong place is better than a tentative stroke in the right place. And I think what he, he wasn't arguing for being inaccurate. He was just saying that, you know, if you lay a big stroke down and it's confident, maybe it doesn't follow the exact contour of the mountain, but it'll look it'll carry better than if you laid, if you're absolutely accurate with every bump, but you're very tentative in your, in laying on your paint. One thing I have to do here, excuse me again, reaching across. White paint, which I should have in here, unless I took it out already. Oh no, there it is. Squeeze out just a little more white paint here. You want me to show the reference photo again? Sure, yeah, and you're going to see how different it is. Yep. Just so people can see it again. Yeah. So one one thing that might be shocking, but but maybe it's um, maybe it's kind of nice to see is just noting how. I'm not copying anything. And in this case, I've really changed up a bunch of things just, just to really make a painting uh, that I'm interested in.
coming in dark with this sky so that I can make these clouds really start really start to pop a little bit more you know when if you need to lighten something you have two options right one is to lighten the thing that you're that you want lightened or the other thing is to darken what's next to it in this case I might do a little bit of both if I have time but um, if nothing else I just I want to just walk through this process of um, actually lightening by darkening what's around something. Unfortunately, this is not good. I'm like out of white paint. Can't believe I used a whole tube of white paint. And I We have about 10 minutes, but okay. Come in here with a little bit of the yellow. Again, the I want that yellow in here because the sun is on this. I'm playing with this again. Okay, my wife brought me some more white paint. Now she's going to grab me some more paper towels. So, that's good. All right, I've got these right here. One thing that I've lost that I haven't really kept up with is that this sky getting lighter down here, um, but uh, lighter as in lighter blue, and I need I need to have that. So I'm going to go ahead and do that right here. Still don't like these clouds. I haven't gotten them light enough, have I? They're not light enough at all. They need to be light and warm. So I'm going to see if I can lay it. This is where it gets difficult because I've got, I would normally want this to dry, which is why I use the liquid because by tomorrow it'll be dry. Um, because I'm getting, you know, I'm picking up all the color 
next to it, you can see it's getting all contaminated. So that's not really the best, but I'm still gonna, you know, kind of go forward with it. I think I'm gonna get rid of this dark cloud that's in front of all of this one for, um, I think this is gonna be better if I, if I get rid of that and I just put it over here. But it's a series of corrections, isn't it? Like I talked about, I mean, you're watching me just over and over, change this, change that, do this, do that. Initially, I was talking about seeing the red down in here, more red than I see up here. And so I'm putting some of that in there. And then I'm going to put a little where this transitions from the, uh, the darker part of the cloud again. We talked about this earlier when I painted it another time. Need a little more blue. Well, I think it's going, it's going somewhere, but it's taking its sweet time. But that's the way that it, that's the way that it goes. That's just the way that it goes. Um, so. I'm not unhappy with the journey, but you know, it'd be nice for you if you could see me bring it right to a finish within two hours, but that doesn't always happen. Um, and that's, you know, again, that's typical for me. Here, here's a comment that fits right in. Helen says, I really appreciate the freedom you're showing us in the process. I prefer calling it adjustment instead of correction. I like that. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yep. A series of adjustments. That's good. And we have about four minutes left. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Sure. It's like, hurry up and make it happen. Do it. <laughs> Don't mess around anymore. That's so okay but, not to finish a painting as well. Yeah. Well, you know, <clears throat> my, my work sort of... Um, I don't know, it has sort of a, a playful kind of quality to it, I think, at least when I like it the most, it does. And a lot of that has to do with staying in, uh, not, not getting pigeonholed early on or not being afraid to change things, you know, being willing to go for it and change it. And... So that's what I'm, that's what I'm exhibiting here. That's not a good shape of a cloud though right now, is it? It's not the best. 
So that's part of what I'm fighting with is what shape do I want that cloud to be in the end? Maybe I just change the shape of it a little bit. So I've never gotten those white clouds on there sufficiently, have I? It's not going to happen. It's a lot of back oh. and forth. I, I know where I want them, but. We are out of time. Okay. That's where I want them. Last few strokes. <laughs> That's where I want them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what a great way to end a very interesting and enlightening uh, <laughs> Eric. It, it's been fun to watch your your technique and how <laughs> thank you, you. Keep, keep changing things and and that's terrific i i really like that so yeah well it, it's interesting <laughs> but thank you jim thank you everybody yeah thank you eric it was was a very fun fun and enlightening demonstration so we're we'll look forward to seeing the the final painting uh great Getting some thank yous in the chat as well. So, uh, oh, good. I wish I wish everybody well. Um, don't do what I do. Do what I say, kind of thing, right? Like, <laughs> you you don't have to struggle as much as me. But hey, but enjoy the enjoy the ride. Thanks again, Eric. Thanks, thank you Jim. so much. Thank Happy you. Bye bye. Bye bye.